good morning. Um, thank you to Dr. Balde Raj for inviting me uh, to this uh, forum. Um, just a, a quick, uh, I'm a scientist in the National Chemical Laboratory and I head a department called Encil Innovations and Venture Center is our business incubator. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about it as well. Uh, Venture Center is today India's largest uh, inventive enterprises incubator and uh, uh, it actually works on non-IT startups and there are more than 45 odd startups focused on inventive uh, ideas. So uh, we'll take it uh, ahead from here. Um, when I was uh, told about this event actually uh, got me thinking about what, what it means to me and uh, some of the things which we are doing. We call it by different names but uh, in effect this is what I think it means. Uh, first of all, inclusive manufacturing should definitely mean empowering and enabling all to participate in the manufacturing enterprise. And that does not mean only as employees. That could mean any form, could be as investors, could be as uh, suppliers, as customers, as in whatever form, right? And, uh, and even as people building some of those manufacturing enterprises. And in uh, one key thing which we find is access to some of these key resources which enable people to participate in, in this activity. It could be know-how, it could be funds. By the way, many of uh, the people here have spoken about, uh, for example, know-how for such enterprises or people have talked about funds or expertise and so on. There's another important aspect which puts uh, everything together which is the ecosystem and of course access to markets. A couple of things about ecosystems. It's important to understand that if you're in a, just imagine that you were crossing a small pond and there were stones in front of you uh, to cross over the pond. Uh, and uh, let's say you take the first two steps and then you realize that there's a big gap between that stone and the next one ahead of you. You would just not, it's, it, those, that, those stones would be of no use to you to cross the pond, right? An ecosystem is like that. Uh, it needs to be not only complete, it's not enough to have pieces of the ecosystem. It needs to be complete, it needs to have all parts of the ecosystem to thrive. And that is an important aspect which many people forget. They create parts of it but forget the rest of it. You create a startup with early stage money and then you forget that you need many more steps ahead to take it all the way to conclusion and those steps just don't exist. So why is it that IT thrived in India to, you know, the IT services industry has thrived in India? It's partly because the ecosystem that it needs is limited. It, you can start in a room with a few people and a com computer there and, uh, you know, money needed to take it all the way is not as much and you can take it all the way. On the other side, other side, if you take a typical biotech enterprise, is you know the, the density and the richness of the ecosystem needed is very large. Why do rural enterprises struggle? They struggle because the ecosystem is weak very often. And if you don't work within the ecosystem that's available, you're unlikely to succeed. Or at least you need to find ways to extend your ecosystem. Sometimes you can use external ecosystems to leverage and bolster your ecosystem. But that has to be thought through. Um, models and open frameworks that facilitate inclusiveness are also important. For example, know-how. If you're thinking of how to source know-how, do we have models to make them accessible and available? 80% of the public fund, uh, 80% of the research spending in India happens in publicly funded research institutions, right? So much of the work and the facilities and the assets are being created in publicly funded institutions. So if that know-how that's being created there is not being leveraged towards various other productive activities and in manufacturing. Um, we need to think what is wrong with those models and frameworks which make that possible. The second aspect uh, of inclusive manufacturing is delivering the benefits of manufacturing to all, both current and future generations. So you need to of course talk about sustainability in all of this. And uh, there is a uh, some of you might have read uh, this paper by Professor Prahlad from Michigan and Dr. Mashelkar in Harvard Business Review and they have preferred to call this Gandhian innovation where they are focusing on products aimed at the masses for all um, and as Dr. Mashelkar often calls it more for less for more 
uh, more for less money for more people, right? Um, and um, but this we have to be careful should not be prescriptive, but empowering. Especially in rural environments, sometimes many of us sitting in urban environments and uh, institutions uh, forget uh, that the aspirations might not be very different from what we have. So it is really important to look at it from the right perspective. Um, it's very easy to be prescriptive. Something you know that seems so-called more appropriate for that environment may or may not be necessarily appropriate. Um, my father used uh, was involved in setting up the India Mark II hand pumps many, many, many years ago in India, and that was a big change and brought water to many people. But as years passed by, uh, a common refrain was that people wanted piped water, right? They did not want the hand pump anymore. And piped water because they saw it in the movies, you know? If the Bollywood movies actually are a much bigger influence than what you can imagine. They want the same things. So why are we being prescriptive, right? Uh, we need to actually find what they need and meet those requirements as well. And we would want many participants as beneficiaries. And of course, it needs to be responsible and sustainable. Keeping doors and windows open long enough is another important issue. I just want to quickly point to that as well. Uh, as to be inclusive, you need to make sure that other people are not making things exclusive for themselves, right? You need to keep doors open for yourself. How do you make it inclusive otherwise? So just to touch on a few points is this. We have tried in our own way. Um, I run an incubator called the Venture Center. It's basically an innovation ecosystem for manufacturing and product companies which are inventive. There are about 45 odd startups. We are the largest inventive enterprises incubate in the country. About 75% of the startups have more inventive products. 31% of the startups have women founders, which by the way is much larger than uh, many other places in the world. And most of the startups are founded by first generation entrepreneurs. Especially in the knowledge business in India today, it's very important to tap first generation entrepreneurs. Okay, um, the, the dichotomy uh, Professor Ravi mentioned uh, about between Lakshmi and Saraswati is real, and we need to. If you want to build knowledge-based startups, it has you have to tap knowledge-based uh, enterprises, uh, entrepreneurs, and workers. So we have tried to build an ecosystem which is conducive, which is available, accessible, transparent, affordable, and of course it can't be free. Uh, we need to also build a sustainable uh, enterprise out here and reduce dependencies. Um, for us, social innovation and entrepreneurship is about a couple of these three things, which is it needs to be inclusive, it needs to be sustainable, and it needs to be scalable. Um, Ambuj yesterday mentioned about scalability, and I think he's bang on target there. And for us, the role model and benchmark would be something like Amul, right? Um, in my opinion, it's inclusive, it's sustainable, and scalable. And probably, and if some of you have not read uh, Dr. Var Varghese Kurian's book, I Too Had a Dream, it's worth a good, it's worth a read. And uh, this is something which I think sh we, we need to uh, learn from and deploy. Of course, the cooperative model is not the best in all situations, but definitely there are common threads and themes which we can uh, uh, pick up on and uh, look at. So inclusive in terms of all the beneficiaries, in terms of who is contributing to it as customers, producers, employers. We look at sometimes products meant for the poor, so we are basically saying we want to include them as customers. Sometimes we look at the poor as producers, as these uh, dairy farmers, and we are trying to be inclusive there, right? Uh, sustainable. It needs to be sustainable, you know. Uh, Dr. Devi Shetty once said in one of her talks, uh, um, and sustainability has to do with scalability also, that it also needs to, uh, that charity is not scalable, okay? And that I agree with entirely. We need to find models of scalability which does not rely on charity, right? And so therefore, maybe a for-profit model or a, what we call not-for-profit organizations, by the way, is not, it doesn't mean that they can't make profits, they just don't distribute it, okay? And that is also a theme that one can look at. Here are a couple of quick examples. Um, this is one of our startups which has built a 300 tons per day food waste management plant in Pune called Novel Exchange. There's one in Bangalore also, by the way. Um, um, and this is looking at how to manage food waste in cities in a centralized manner. Another company which is looking at uh, a pomegranate blight 
Yet another, which is looking at affordable implants in a place where um, actually Indian markets sometimes are so small in the healthcare space uh, and so spread out and heterogeneous that it's too difficult to, I mean, in, in fact, large multinationals sometimes even ignore India as a market. Okay, and uh, they don't bother to even make it accessible. So there's a need for dealing with some of those issues. Ramuja is looking at powering productive applications in rural villages. These are all our um, incubates and also some companies related to NCL. Biopore is an NCL technology. Genrich is a oxygen enrichment for COPD patients, which is also an enriched technology. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Raju, when she mentioned about Suarna, which is uh, something which NCL worked with uh, Nari to make it happen. Last slide about intellectual property. There's a lot of discussion, so I thought I should talk about it a little bit. Basically, the way we look at it is this especially patents, for example, in my opinion, are mechanisms to incentivize inventors to disclose their invention. Please remember, these are mechanisms to disclose inventions to the public. And therefore, that itself is an act of inclusion, in my opinion. Imagine a world where everybody kept trade secrets uh, and you didn't have access to it as a developing world. That would be a disaster, believe me. In return for a period where they can exclude others, and that too it's a period where they can exclude others. So how should we deal with it? How do we increase, increase inclusiveness? I think our strategy should be to aim to not get excluded, right? Uh, it is not to necessarily deride the system. We cannot do away with it, but we have to know how to not get excluded. And strategies for inclusiveness should include reducing barriers faced by inventors in inventing and filing of patents. More the competing ideas, less the dependence on a few, right? And in India, there are a lot of barriers. And that's one of the things which I think Professor Anil Gupta, the great thing I like about it is he has opened out the doors for common inventors, for individual inventors, to do some of the activities that, so we are reducing barriers. Institutions also need to do the same, and not necessarily erect new barriers, uh, you know, by, especially for example, by insisting professors to pay for it, <laughs> for patenting costs and so on and so forth. Encourage preemptive filings and public disclosures by benevolent owners of technology. It's important to remember that you can disclose and hence prevent people from filing and uh, creating exclusive environments. And those have to be driven by governments, charities, and individuals. As a country and society, we need to place an opportunity cost on getting excluded to justify the cost of getting into inventing and patenting, right? That means there's a cost associated with exclusion also. Last point, two points. We, we need to look at things like patent pools uh, and making ac know-how accessible to MSMEs in various new ways. And uh, solution may not lie in rejecting the patent system. So I'll close here. That's my last slide. Thank you very much.